of a legend, becoming one himself. Bob Brown, with an incredible talent, rocky road to success. His father's son, when 2020 continues. <laughs> To be named anything of the year, mother, teacher, athlete, takes quite a special person. But we have proof of that tonight, a telling profile of the person who this year is country music's entertainer of the year. And the winner is Hank Williams Jr. <laughs> Hank Williams Jr. He's the son of the man who perhaps more than any other person gave country music its popular appeal. You would hardly know it looking at him, but at the age of 38, Hank Williams Jr. has had enough pain to last him a lifetime. A few years ago, Bob Brown brought us his story, and what with Hank Jr. at a new height in his career, we felt an encore was in order. He is fascinated by guns, as his father was. Hillbilly's two, enemy zero. Fascinated by the cause and effect relationship between the parts. Load one, you skip one, you drop one. You drop by knowing what will happen and why it will happen. Drop one. It's a feeling that was difficult drop to grasp one. when he was younger because he was swept up in an unpredictable form of cause and effect between the legend his father had left behind and its impact on his life. Hank Williams Jr. was raised to sing his father's songs, Honky Tonkin', Your Cheatin' Heart, Jambalaya, songs that still generate a half million dollars a year in royalty checks nearly 35 years after Hank Sr.'s death. You know, when Daddy died in the newspaper clippings, it says Hillbilly Singer dies. But that Hillbilly left a hell of a mark. With 11 million selling records between 1949 and 1953, Hank Williams gave country music a national voice. But he was also addicted to alcohol and the pain-killing drugs he took because of a spinal defect. And he died, burned out, at the age of 29, when Hank Jr. was only three and a half. Williams' heart failed on New Year's Day, 1953. He was in the back seat of his Cadillac on his way to a singing date. And when other country artists remembered him to Hank Jr., it was with the almost religious belief that the qualities in Hank Sr.'s songs had come from his suffering. It was always, your daddy went through this stuff. You'll have to go through it. We have to go through these things, you know. And they were talking about booze and pills and yeah, long and nights. depression, you know, that's a big sport to a lot of people, I think. <laughs> and it was just drilled into me a lot, you know. Don't play your cheating heart. Lord, it tells us all upon. It makes the whiskey man hell I just put Daddy's record on the jukebox and get a nice fifth of whiskey and a couple of downers and sit there and and try to communicate with him. Oh, Hank's songs always make us feel Hank Sr.'s troubles were recalled with chilling insight by a friend, comedian Minnie Pearl, who once rode in a car with him just to keep him sober between performances. She tried to ease his nerves by urging him to sing a hymn called, I Saw the Light. And all of a sudden he stopped and looked at me and of course I'll never forget it because it was such a haunted look he gave me and he said, but that's just it Minnie, there ain't no light. Hank Williams' gravesite was dedicated in Montgomery, Alabama, a year and a half after his death. The small boy in the hat is Hank Williams, Jr. Barely five years old, he had already learned how to tip his hat to a crowd 
as he rode in a parade after the dedication, followed by a riderless horse representing the father he vaguely remembered. Just like a blind man, I wondered of long worries and fears I claimed for my own. Hank Jr.'s mother, the late Audrey Williams, quickly became the caretaker of the Williams legend, even though she'd been divorced from Hank Sr. She groomed Hank Jr. to take his place. You were on the road and you'd started before I was on the road when I was eight. When they came to see that eight-year-old and ten-year-old, it wasn't for his wonderful voice. It was because he was the son of Hank Williams. They expected the miracle that had happened with his father, but I'm sure he felt when he'd come out on the stage that he was fighting a phantom because he was fighting the image of his father. Tonight, Hank Williams Jr., the 14-year-old son, to sing some of his dad's country music kids. Let's have a fine welcome for this youngster. Hank Jr. was a country singing idol with a $300,000 a year recording contract by the time he was 14. Son of a gun will have big fun. Most of his friends were adults. His education came from a tutor. You're cheating hard. He was put through the rites of passage on the road. They would try to give me a drink, you know, when I was 10 or 12. Say, well, okay, we'll get a little hank of drink here. The old steel players and everything. Did anybody ever tell you that you shouldn't do those things? No, the road wasn't like that. I grew up quick. Did you ever get to the point where you just couldn't function, or were you always able to... Oh, yeah, I was in the hospital several times. Oh, yeah. Yeah, all the way out. The pills, you know, and the whiskey and the whole thing. I was really rolling in it. You cry and cry And try to sleep I thought I was going to die a couple of times, and that scared the heck out of me. Audiences always knew whether he was doing his father's songs the way they wanted to hear them. And if he diverged too far from what hardcore fans expected, he was often forced into exchanges with hecklers. Hey, sing, uh, hey, good looking. Well, I just, I just sang it, you know, and you were so drunk you didn't hear it, or I don't, I'm gonna do this other one. Why you little so-and-so your daddy would have? So, uh, that didn't go over too good. So I, I thumped one of them. <laughs> you thumped somebody? I thumped him, yeah, in Salt Lake City, I think. And boy, that felt good. It was uh, driving me crazy. I had a psychiatrist tell me, that he said, hey, you've been taught, you know, live like, act like, be like, sing like your daddy. Your, your lifestyle is exactly like it is, and you're, you're going to be gone, too. And I said, to hell with this. I'm not putting up with this crap. And I, I just left, and I said, bye. Saying goodbye meant leaving Nashville, moving to Cullman, Alabama, getting a new manager who knew nothing about the music industry, and rearranging his life. He was 26 years old, and he decided to put the other styles of music he liked to use. Blues guitar and southern rock, and the piano styles of Ray Charles or Jerry Lee Lewis. Going on. Going on down in my hillbilly barn. You know, you do it and it's true, and uh, you put it together, it's either a failure or a success. But failure is your fault. Success is your fault. That's a good feeling. So you were on your way. Yeah, it was really looking pretty good. And I had gotten uh, this part straightened out you know, the whiskey and the drugs and the uh, cloning of Hank Williams. So I said, I'll either make it this way, or I'm going to go open that mailbox and get daddy's checks and, uh, and do a hell of a lot of hunting and fishing. But then, as he approached the age at which his father had died, he narrowly escaped his own death. Oh, 
Hank Jr. had grown up loving the outdoors. This trip took him into the Davis Mountains of West Texas on a deer hunt. How far away it was. <laughs> the hunt was staged from a small cabin campsite with a group of friends, including Montana rancher Dick Willie. Willie was also with Hank Jr. in 1975 on a mountain climb in one of their favorite areas of Montana. It was that climb that nearly killed Hank Jr. We're crossing this snow field, about 9,000 feet elevation, and um, he slipped and uh, fell in the neighborhood of five to 700 feet. You want to stop so bad, but you can't stop. And I'm going down through there, and then uh, there was a, a sharp boulder up in it, and it did the job right, right between the old eyes. He hit it face first. Yeah. Yeah. About the only thing he had left was the one eye. Uh, it literally tore his nose off, uh, uh, drove it up through his head, and um, uh, blew a hole in his forehead, which exposed the brain. And um, as far as his lower uh, part of his head, his jaws, teeth, gums, uh, they were pretty much uh, uh, ruined. You know, the doctor said that you've been left here for something. Yeah, he said your brain was out and, and penetrated with that rock a little. Whatever you want to be, he said, I suggest you follow it, because you talk about people say they've been born again. He said, believe me, you were. You realize how quick time can run out. Climbed up the Rockies and I swam down the snake. And I spent winters trapping in the Mosery breaks. This ain't the first time I've been in a jam. I'm from Two Dot, Montana, and I don't give a damn. In the 12 years since the accident, he has repeatedly undergone corrective surgery. He still wears dark glasses to cover his eyes, and his hat conceals a skin graft over a plate in his forehead. The self-pity is gone, he says. So is his patience with trivial details. And if he seems abrasive because of that, he doesn't complain about what he lost or apologize for what he gained because he is Hank Williams' son. I got a shotgun, a rifle, and a four-wheel drive, and a country boy can survive. Country folks can survive. There will be people who will come up to him as long as he lives and say, I loved your father. And I'm sure as he gets older now, Bob, I think he may more and more uh, cherish that because he will realize more and more what a, a truly great heritage he had. Hank had a charisma and an excitement that he brought on stage with him. It was just like a Christmas. Hank Williams was king of country soul. And that's the part I had to, to grab a hold of, the fun Hank Williams, the one without squirrel hunting and pulling jokes. I'd just known about the other part too much. Well, the people got mad and they all went home. First thing they did was put his records on. I guess they should have left him alone, let him sing his song. many hecklers left in the concert halls, and his father's legacy still runs through his music. But it seems to belong to him now, instead of owning him. And by surviving it, he learned to do one thing better than his father. He learned how to outlive him. Why don't you leave them alone? Let him sing their song. Quite a story. How is he doing now? He's doing great. Every album that he recorded since he recovered from the fall off the mountain has gone gold or platinum. Mm -hmm. uh, he's one of the top grossing concert acts of any type of artist in the country. It shows that you got to do it your own way, huh? Yeah, and he's a happy man tonight. He's back in Montana, and out his window he can see the mountain that he uh, fell off of, but wow. he says he's happy just being a Montana rancher. Wow, very interesting. Thank you, Bob. We'll be right back. <laughs> 